Opening up proceedings today, this is the second broadcast in the remade, remodeled EVA 25 subscription series. Um, by and large, most of the speakers who were lined up for the physical event in, in May of, of earlier this year have all signed up to come and present uh, in this sequence as well. And I'm delighted that uh, we've got Sophie Savage to come along and uh, uh, talk about creativity in crisis. I met Sophie uh, about 18 months ago now, I think it was. I know a chap called Stuart Desson who specializes in psychometric psychological profiling with a product called Luminous Spark. And he's somebody that I met from the University of Westminster. And Luminous Spark was something that I made the board of directors of the APM do to try and better discover how they ticked so that we could all get on better with each other as a board. It was a, a way of trying to get the board more functional, more rapidly. And he, uh, I think, is a member of um, uh, a, a particular institute related to psychology, and he went wild about Sophie and her wonderful presentations and, and her whole story. So I got in touch with Sophie and she was kind enough to agree to come and speak at a, uh, another event and is, is now back again today. So without further ado, Sophie, uh, welcome. Um, we look forward very much to hearing a, a more mindset than tool set approach today. Uh, what's going on inside your head rather than what mm -hmm. buttons you're pushing metaphorically. OK, so welcome, Sophie. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm going to just dive straight in. Crisis, a time of intense difficulty, is the new normal. And crisis management, which is often an attempt to control the uncontrollable, has become a very inadequate response. But crisis is also the birthplace of creativity and real change, if you know how to throw your arms around it and kiss it on the lips. Let me be more specific about why it's become the new normal, and I'm sure you will be very familiar with the following. <clears throat> it's so normal that the business world, as you know, has given it an acronym, VUCA, Volatile, Uncertain, Complex and Ambiguous. And as I speak, we're in the middle of several global crises the COVID-19 pandemic, which is having a devastating impact on the economy and on many businesses, while also toppling our norms, expectations and dominoes, uh, and entitlements like dominoes. We're also in the midst of the, great, of the climate change crisis and third great extinction, which is a clear and present catastrophe that requires a more creative response than we have mustered so far. The economic disparities of the world, which we have become so extreme, we've lost our ethical compass. The Black Lives Matter movement, which is rising with appropriate ferocity, is calling businesses to dig much deeper into issues of diversity. There's also an epidemic of loneliness, which is killing more people than cancer, diabetes and heart disease, by the way, and is particularly stigmatized among successful business leaders. I'm just, these are just a few. I could go on and on and on about the global crises that we're in the midst of. One in three people are now being diagnosed with cancer, which at least in part is a consequence of our failure to deal with ongoing crises like pollution, asbestos, pesticides. <clears throat> My dad died of lung cancer caused by asbestos. And I personally was handed a six months to live terminal cancer diagnosis in 2014 exactly six years ago, I'm very proud to say. I'm still here and I'm thriving in many ways. So <clears throat> I've been equipping individuals and businesses to unleash their creative powers on their most challenging experiences for 30 years. But during these recent years, I've been to the North and South Poles of my creativity, not just to stay alive, but to thrive, produce, write Sunday Times bestsellers, build a big business and make a significant difference to my clients. So this really is one of my favorite, possibly my favorite subject to speak about. Now, <clears throat> the dictionary definition of crisis is very simply, oh, 
crisis is the birthplace of creativity. Very simply, um, the dictionary defines crisis as a time of intense difficulty, but I define it as every unexpected, unwanted, sometimes blindsiding moment that comes your way. Now, I know many of you, or at least some of you, are project management leaders who are very familiar with spinning various plates and responding to time critical schedules. So I'm sure you will um, recognize the daily flow of these moments. You could call them mini crises on a daily basis. I, I call them life shocks. Um, and the key thing to know about life shocks is that when we're failing to give them our discerning attention, they just come at us bigger, faster and louder until we do, which is why major crises have become the new normal, because we have not been paying not just nearly enough attention, but 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 <sighs> a poor quality of attention too. Consequently, we need to engage in the business of life shocks. Um, and in the business of bringing our creativity to an unexpected moment in your day, um, a little mini crisis at work when something comes at you, but also to the crises of our times. Um, so I'm going to share with you today one thing that can unleash your creativity in response to any crisis. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to share with you today one thing that can unleash your creativity in response to any crisis if you learn to master that one thing. Now, I'm sure you've heard the expression thinking out of the box, which usually means thinking unconventionally or from a different perspective. But for my purposes today, I want to define it as the ability to see possibilities that most others cannot see. But what is the box? How do we know we're thinking inside the box, let alone how do we know if we're thinking outside the box? And how can we make thinking outside the box a daily norm instead of a once in a while brainwave or brilliant idea? That's what I'm going to take you into now. So I'm speaking to you as a psychologist in this moment. Psychologically, to keep it very simple, there are basically two states of mind, um, two states of being, reactivity and creativity. So reactivity is separating, limiting and self-deceiving and creativity is connecting, expansive and self-realizing. Now you're either in one or the other at any time. There's no middle ground, like there's no half pregnant. And what's important to say about this is reactivity is actually our automatic state unless we pay attention and shift ourselves out of it. So many people actually spend their entire lives in this state and have no idea what else is possible. And there's nothing wrong with it per se. It's normal, it's the norm. And every corporate client I've ever served as a consultant has an in the box culture they are usually oblivious to. So in the reactive state, we can, we become, well, it can manifest in numerous different ways. We can be anxious, arrogant, controlling, bossy, passive, false positive, false negative, um, professional but phony, um, less than, better than, we can get very driven and fo task focused at the expense of connecting with other people. There are many, many um, emotions and behaviours that manifest when we're in this state. But underneath it all is fear, whether you're aware of it or not. So it's a, basically a state of fear. And we become so used to being in this state, we think it's we think it's who we are and we call it living. Um, but I'm sure many of you have had experiences when you've um, just surprised yourself or shifted your emotional state and suddenly your creativity has 
um, come through you um, in a very natural and easy way. Uh, but when we're in this state of reactivity, creativity can't breathe. It just can't breathe. So I'm going to say more about being in the creative space in a minute, but um, there's actually more than one box. And I'm going to share with you, I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of a, a map of a, a, a map of human mindsets, uh, what I call the psychology of creativity. But I just first want to talk about the word motivation, because uh, motivation is one of these words that's really been so overused and oversold that it doesn't have any meaning anymore. If you Google the word motivation, <clears throat> the Internet kind of blows up. If you Google motivational speaker, I think about 30 million, 40 million items appear. Um, and there's an, there's, an, there's, this, there's an assumption that motivation is always a good thing. If you just motivate your people and, um, you know, get, get them fired up, then that is a good thing. And there are literally, it's a multi-million, maybe billion dollar industry is based on that assumption, which is an inaccurate assumption because an amoeba is motivated. Bin Laden was motivated. Hitler was highly, highly motivated. So motivation isn't necessarily a good thing. What really matters is what you're motivated by. That is the key question. And I'm going to share with you um, some core mo motivational states, um, motives for action, um, to illuminate this for you. So the first of these is a motive for action called impossibility. Now, I hope you're all going to recognize this. I hope that I'm just giving you a language for experiences you will all have had many, many times. So the, the box of impossibility is a state in which we think, I can't do something. I can't. So if you're thinking, I can't, 90% of the time, that isn't true. Sometimes it's true, I can't fly, for example, um, and I can't, and I'm mortal, and there are certain limitations we have, but very often I can't is, um, is an inaccurate perception that kills your creativity. Um, and it, it generates uselessness, pointlessness, hopelessness, giving up, resignation, at its very worst, people take their own lives when they're in this state. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, it can be a small thing. You, you can, it, you might experience this as yet one more request comes in with an unreasonable de de deadline and your immediate thought is, are you freaking kidding me right now? I can't handle this today. I've got too much on my plate. I can't do it enough. That's an ex just a day-to-day -day experience of impossibility, and then we pull up our socks and get on with it. Um, so uh, another example of this, I mean, I went into, I don't often go into this state, actually, but I did state when COVID hit because all my work is in person. I do talks, I run courses, um, I deliver programs. And for about a day, I went, all my, all my, um, Events were cancelled in a week. For all my all my events were cancelled in a week, and um, and I was believing um, I can't do what I do another way. I can't do deep dive people with people online. I I can't. I can't. I can't. I just went into that mindset, and then I'm going to let people down, especially my family, and we're going to end up losing our livelihood and our home and all that kind of fear that runs underneath. Well, it didn't last long. Um, but many people, I have numerous clients um, who went into this state at this time. And I don't doubt that some businesses have gone under, at least in part, because their leaders have been in this state with regard to COVID-19. The next 
motive for action. The next box is called survival. Now, this is a highly motivating, highly motivating, but very, very stressful state of mind in which you have to get it done. Uh, there's no option. You have to, have to, have to. So the language is important when you hear this going through your mind. I have to I have to get by, I have to struggle on, I have to make the best of it, I have to try really hard, I have to do this brilliantly well, I've got to fix it, I have to um, make everything okay, I've got to sort this problem out, all that kind of I have to, have to, have to. Underneath it, usually unconscious, is an or else, like or else I'll lose my job, or else I'll lose control, or else I'll fall apart be humiliated, be found out as a useless scumbag and end up sleeping under the arches. I mean, I <laughs> it's not quite that way, but um, there's an unconscious fear driving the have to's. And when you're in this box, you'll feel stress, anxiety, pressure, um, uh, quite a lot of adrenaline. And you'll often become very, very task focused busy, driven, controlling, even relentless when you're in this state. Um, and again, many of my clients operate from this state much of the time and until I teach them how to get out of it. Um, an example of this was a, a nurse um, who was working on the front line in a care home and she was delivered very inadequate PPE. She was looking after um, very vulnerable people and she'd locked herself down with these vulnerable people. Um, and now this was her state of mind and in some ways literal survival was at stake but in her case she saw these, these inadequate masks she'd been sent. She thought we'd been thrown under a bus I have to protect these people, I have to keep them safe, I have to fight for them, I have to save them, I have to do what the government won't do or else they'll die and I will die and it will be my fault and I will fail them and I'm a failure and I'm out of my depth. I mean, these were, I quote, what came out of her head when I worked with her. So um, that's an example of being in that very, I have to, have to, have to, or else something terrible is gonna happen. But another more, uh, uh, literally, the, an example that in which you're not literally, your life isn't literally on the line was I work with a retail company, um, a, a very successful retail company for about five years. And when I was doing diagnostic work with them, um, I, I discovered they had 40% staff turnover and I got very curious about that and I went to um, just observe their work in one of their stores one Saturday morning and there was a director in this business who was really scary. He was a legend um, and it was quite a bullying culture, very top town bullying culture and he used to come and shop at this store on a Saturday morning. And they were so scared of them that the whole shop, all the staff went boom into survival on Saturday mornings. And they, um, true story, they knew which products he wanted to buy and product availability was a really important KPI. So they would remove his products from the shelves before he arrived, keep them back in the storeroom um, so that when he got there they would be available and they sent a, like a meerkat out to the car park who would send word his car is coming and then it was all hands on deck and all the products were out and all the staff were smiling and everything looked perfect it was operational excellence for all the wrong reasons and what he walked into was a lie so that's how survival can manifest in a workplace um, and it's worth looking out for when morale is low and anxiety is high. The next state motive for action is a state of mind called obligation. Now, obligation is often related to our values, but these become duties and demands instead of choices and purposes. And it sounds like this in your head. 
I should, or I must, or I ought to. So I should get this done, I should do my duty, I should be professional, I should conform, I should do the right thing, I should be perfect, um, etc. Or else I'm going to disappoint, be a disappointment, be a bad person and end up useless and not good enough. Now, <clears throat> most of us do our tax returns in this box. Um, most of us. And um, I've seen many cancer patients uh, in this box obeying their doctors. They follow protocols blindly and they think, I, I, I should do what he says. I should do what she says. And that throttles their creativity. So they don't take charge of their own treatment because they're in obligation to do what they're told. Um, Managers and leaders become process driven again in this state, but also judgy and emotionally disconnected. So you'll do what needs to be done in obligation, but it will feel boring and tiresome and uninspiring. Uh, FYI, Donald Trump has been in obligation at best about wearing a mask and um, the consequences are unfolding. So. In this state, you have extremely high standards for yourself and other people, but it, which never lead to inevitable disappointment. The next motive for action, the next box is called desire. Now, this is a very, very powerful box that when you're in it, you feel a lot of adrenaline, a lot of excitement. You're highly productive. Um, you will create big results. Um, most highly successful businesses that I've worked with operate in this state most of the time. Um, it feels exciting and energizing and thrilling to be in this state <clears throat> and you can be quite creative in this state too. Um, but it's the never enough train. So when you're in this state um, you achieve one thing and you get a quick fix of satisfaction and then you set the next goal and then you get a quick fix of satisfaction and then you set the next goal and you get another quick fix of satisfaction. But it's never, ever, ever, ever enough. You're never fully satisfied because it's really underneath it is. Um, it sounds like I really, really want to do this, but underneath it is or else. Um, I'm going to fail. I won't be special. I'll just be a mediocre person. So I have to prove, prove, prove myself by creating more and more and more results that actually never satisfy me. And the real problem with this state is that ultimately there's a very high price that gets paid. Um, so I worked with HBOS. I was working with the retail side of HBOS when the commercial side declared a 10, million, 10 billion pound loss because someone had gotten into desire, desire when they were trading and they were out to prove something and they literally destroyed the business by, because they were in that state of des desire. Um, so it ultimately leads to burnout significant failure or a devastating mistake um, that kills businesses off quite literally. So it's a it's it's not an easy one to spot, but an important one to be aware of. Now, little interlude. All those states in possibility, survival, obligation and desire are in the box. They're all in the reactive state of mind. And um, it's like what happens to our creativity is we're seeing through the lens of these have to, shoulds, can'ts and all the fears that are underneath them. And it's like we're looking at the situation, we're looking at the crisis through a very limited lens. And we, we literally can't see what's possible when we're in these states. We can see some of the possibilities. If you notice, my fingers are open. So I can see some things I could do. I could see some solutions. I can see some problems I can fix. I can even see some things I can create. But I can't see 
what's really available when I'm in this state of mind. So when you get out of this state, you enter the state of creativity. Creativity, creativity, creativity. And what happens when you get out of creativity, which is based in I choose to, it's I choose to, I'm willing to, I'm up for this because I have a purpose, because I know my worth already, I, I have nothing to prove. Um, when we're in this state, what happens is um, we don't have to fix anything anymore suddenly the blinders come off and we can see like an orchard of possibilities, uh, an orchard of ripe plums ready to be picked that we could not see because we were in the box. And sometimes really surprising possibilities show up that you can't even imagine will come your way. So when we're in the state, it's more I choose to respond, I choose to risk, have a go, experiment, discover, explore. I'm willing to make mistakes. I'm willing to be vulnerable. I'm willing to screw up and learn from it. I'm willing to um, be flexible. Um, I'm willing to set boundaries and work within my true limitations and release my perceived limitations. Um, because I know who I am and I know what I'm, wor I'm worth and I know what I'm about and I know where my talents lie and I know where my limits are. And um, I'm a human being who's going to give it all I've got. So this is the space where we can recognize our true talents and our true limits, where we can see who we are and who we're not. We can respond to what is so with all the purpose and power and humility we have available to us. And we. this is the place where we literally accept the things we cannot change, change the things we can, and find the wisdom to know the difference. So just to give you some examples of this, that nurse I told you about, she got out of survival into creativity. Um, she was locked down with these patients. She posted a fundraiser online. She said, I'm going to create, I'm going to get the PPE that they need. I choose to do that. I'm going to find a way to do that. She just started getting creative, raising money. Within, I think, 10 days, she'd ordered and paid for all the PPE that they needed for several months, just because she got out of the box and into her creativity. Um, just a personal example of me. I mean, for me, it was clearly I went into deep, deep survival when I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. I was given six months to live at that point in time. But the one thing I knew how to do was how to get out of this state. And I knew I was in it. So while they were figuring out how to treat my body, I was treating my mind and my fear and my terror and my belief that I was going to be dead before my daughter was five years old. And since then, um, these have been actually the most creative and productive years of my entire life. I can share examples of that. And I still go in and out of survival. Um, but I know how to get out and I know how to unleash my creativity on the next crisis. I've just had treatment for my fifth round of brain tumours, for example. Um, and I was told there were no options, but I find options. I keep finding options because I keep putting myself back in that orchard of possibilities. And then something shows up and I go, oh, OK, I'll do that then. It's quite amazing when when it when you experience it. Um, and I also know some business leaders who, when they've gotten into this state, have pivoted their businesses in response to COVID in incredibly powerful ways. So I'm going to just draw this to a close. This was a whistle stop tour of the human condition, basically, in 20 minutes, which is why I'm speaking quite fast. Um, but I hope you recognize these states. Um, one way to summarize them is when you're in impossibility, that's the state of no way. Survival is one way. Obligation is your way. Um, 
because you want to do right by others. Desire is my way. I'm going to do it my way. And creativity, that's the free way. Um, where creativity gets unleashed. It just gets unleashed and comes through you and explodes in response to whatever you're dealing with. And you don't need to work things out even. You just see what's possible and start to move. So um, just to wrap this up for now, I said at the beginning that I'm going to tell you about one thing that can unleash your creativity in response to any crisis, if you learn to master it. I hope this model has given you a lens um, that you recognize and that just being aware of these states and the language that we use when we're, we're in them can make a big difference. You can hear yourself going, I can't, I have to. And sometimes all you need to do is just take three breaths and go, really, do I have to or do I choose to? Really, I can't. Well, actually, I can. Sometimes it's as simple as that when you can catch yourself. Um, but as I see it, rarely have we needed creativity as we need it at this time. So if you want to master shifting your motivational state or um, are interested in the work that I do for individuals, um, you can download this model if you just um, cut and paste that link or take a screenshot of that link. I'm not sure how you do that. I think Steve will send it to you, actually. Um, you can download a much more detailed map, as you can see on the right. And if you're interested in learning more about this, then please let me know and I will get back to you. So that's what I have for you today. And I'd love to hear any questions. Thank you very much, Sophie. That was illuminating. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, again, a, a, a framework for life. Um, does, does, does anybody have any questions? I'll throw it open if anybody wants to make a comment or an observation. Well, I'll lead the way. Um, there are hands. I, I, oh, is there? I beg your pardon. OK, Carol, yes, please uh, switch yourself on and. It's so nice to see your face. Camera. In, yeah. Indeed. Now, I was following protocol and not switching my. I know, but it's weird. Well, 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 yeah. Put screen. your video on if you want now. Please do. Oh, hello. It's much I'm more here. relaxing for me <laughs> to see you. <laughs> I completely understand. I, I run um, uh, student workshops and I had to. Um, gently encourage a student this morning that the way to have a conversation was not to type it in. Mm. Um, and there was just me and this student in the conversation. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, the, the irony was not lost on either of us because the topic of conversation was having a difficult conversation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, thank you, You're Sophie. Welcome. That That was wonderful. Really, really wonderful. And resonates so much. And now I've got somebody at the door, so I'm going to let somebody else okay, say something. Minute, but then. I have a question for you. Sure, I'm so sure. sorry. I'll be back Let's in a second. Back. OK, thanks, Carol. Breda, you're on. Hi, Sophie. Thank you. That was Hi. excellent. Um, so I'm very mindful that this group is is um, normally embraced in a lot of rules and regulations and a lot of procedural things that we've got to bind ourselves to in order mm -hmm. to deliver within the bounds of our remits. I'm curious around advice for us as a group around being creativity within the being creative within those types of constraints and understanding how far we can push those boundaries and still be <laughs> legal as it were, because that, that's probably our, our threshold of limit of, of where we can be creative. So it I'm is, curious about how you advise us. Well, it's such a great question because the temptation with regulations is to rebel against them, which is what you'll do when you're in a state of desire or you'll be in a state of obligation where you're doing your duty, but they're pissing, feeling pissed off about it. So if you're in obligation with them, I'm doing my duty, but I'm pissed off and I wish I could break loose. That would be what would be going through your head. Or I'm going to push the boundaries as much as I can because I want to do this my way. That's desire. Familiar? Does that sound about right? <laughs> okay, good. 
so so the best you can get when you're in obligation or desire with regulations is um, compliance or defiance compliance or defiance but when you get out of the box and into your creativity and get into a place of I choose these regulations, I embrace these regulations, I, I'm willing to work within these constraints. Then you can get incredibly creative within the constraints, because that's one of the things we need to learn as human beings is how to be creative within constraints, because we are limited as human beings. So we've first need to get over the false limitations we impose upon ourselves and then we need to embrace the real limitations set by reality life there are limits there are boundaries we get locked down for four months it's a limit um so how do we get creative within the limitations that can really only happens when you get into the mindset of I choose and I'm willing and I'm I'm free to create within this space. So the orchard has a fence around it, but the orchard's still there. But if you're in desire or obligation, you won't see the orchard. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense to me. Thank you ever so much. Oh, you're welcome. To work with now. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Carol, you're back. Carol, oh. I'm back. Sorry about that. I was waiting for a delivery and I didn't want them to run away. No. Um, uh, thank you again. And great to, to listen to um, uh, Breda's question and your response to it. Um, I, I see the similarities uh, with the, the moving from impossibility through to uh, the, the stages through to creativity with this sense of resistance to change um, and the process people go through. And I just wondered, in, in your experience, to what extent do you see people sort of almost clunking through these different um, boxes from impossibility, survival, obligation, et cetera? Or do you see them really hopping yeah. very much from one to the, to the end? Uh, oh, good question. So this isn't a hierarchy which you move through them. When you're in impossibility, there's really no place else to go but out. So you're either going to sink into despair or you're going to take a day off and hide under the duvet and watch EastEnders and have a packet of biscuits and call in sick. That would be a day of an impossibility. But you can get from I can't out of the box like that. I mean, I teach tools to get you out of these states. That's the work I do. Um, so it isn't always like that. But in some ways, impossibility to creativity is um, can be a quick leap because you, you're as you're as you have zero motivation. Your creativity is dead um, and nothing, nothing. There's no energy or action in that state. So you can shift from one to the next um, all the way out. I, what I notice is people have favorites. Mm depending on the mindsets that they've um, and the beliefs they've held for a very, very long time about who they are, who they believe they are and who they think they have to be. And that gets put in place young. Mm. So if you decide very young, I'm not enough and I have to prove my worth. And then you set about proving, proving, proving your worth. You're going to spend a lot of your time and a lot of your life in the state of desire. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with CEOs who have spent their entire lives in desire, but underneath it, they're just unhappy. And they keep going, why aren't I, why aren't I happy yet? And this is why very successful people ultimately go slam dunk into impossibility and take their own lives. Famous people who've had incredible success. Um, so, and that's all rooted in, um beliefs that are put in place at a young age if you're if you've been taught to be good as a child mm. and behave yourself and don't make a fuss you're likely to spend a lot of time in obligation and that's how you'll behave as an adult so i i you know i'm not i, I hardly ever go into obligation actually um i i spend a lot of my time in desire um 
Um, and interestingly, because I wasn't dutiful with my doctors, I didn't do what they told me a lot. I do listen to them and greatly respect them and often do what they say, but sometimes I don't. Um, and and um, I remember seeing a file open in the hospital that said about me, that said difficult patient in big red writing because I wasn't an obedient patient yeah. who was doing what I was told. And I was like, yep, I'll take that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm quite happy to be a difficult patient. So it really, these mindsets go in deep and they become ingrained and then you'll end up having a favorite, a favorite state that you go into. That, that's my mm. bit of a long response, but I hope a helpful one. That's super, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Carol. Anybody else? Put your hands up. I will put my hand up. Sure. Um, do you think, Sophie, that that people could change? And just echoing on what what Breda said about working as, as as many of us do within very tight constraints of of, of contract or, or or particular rules and regulations. Um, I, I think there's a there's a, there's there's an approach in mindset there where some people like the rules because it it protects them it allows and as long as they do just you know there's this a aspect of doing just enough to keep yourself out of trouble or enough to do the job or uh, where, whereas there are others and I try and count myself in them where they say if I do those rules correctly it and and don't have to worry about whether they're falling apart every week because I've got my systems in place so that 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 that, 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 that foundation is really solid. I then feel that I'm liberated to go off and do all the the great stuff, which is interact with people and talk to people and get creative. You know, so yes. so so how, and how do you move a person who might be, I don't know, uh, a, a bit of a pessimist into that kind of taking that brave step of saying well actually if only I did take that brave step into creativity I'd feel much happier and in actual fact the whole you know as you said the orchard would start to blossom but ha yeah. can you actually change people to do that okay great question so firstly just enough is this in the state of obligation mm. um, and then I'm saying yes to the regulations I'm embracing them so now I'm going to connect with people and not worry about them they're not gonna I, I, I have the regulations they don't have me that would be out of the box rather than the regulations are in charge of my life. That's an attitude. The answer to your question is absolutely yes. I've been I've spent 30 years teaching people to liberate themselves from this these states. I can't teach you how on this call, but I did, you know, please get in touch with me if you want to learn. There are very powerful methods. Um, I, um, you know, I have 30 years of evidence to yeah. say there are very practical, powerful tools to get out of these states, but you don't get out into the box and stay out, by mm. the way. Uh, you don't. You go in and you go out because being in the box is automatic unless you're paying attention and you wake up and you get crises and life shocks mm. come your way saying, you're in the box, wake up. And if you don't pay attention, you get another crisis and another life shock saying, hello, wake up. So crises are awakeners. They say, get out of the box. <laughs> um, that's another whole talk. But um, there are very powerful um, methods for changing yeah. the state, and you can learn them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, well, again, uh, and it really is another conversation, so we won't yeah. drag you back. But, but I'm just thinking, yeah, you know, I've got this image of this person, you know, sparking on and off. And one of the real issues, again, that I've seen an awful lot is that you might be okay, but the culture and the organisation you're in might be so dire, you know, in, in the sense that it's a it's a miserable place to, to go in and know, you know, yeah. I've been to places as a consultant where nobody gives you so much as a glass of water, you know, let, let alone smiles at you or, or, or talks to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that can be massively inhibiting, you know, even to the most bright and cheerful of people, or it can it can create that sort of, a, I don't know, uh, 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 that reactive reaction where you where you just think, well, sod you lot, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go somewhere else, or you know, I, I won't, it, it, it won't bring the best out of me working in this environment. So somehow there's, there's there's this interplay of having the right kind of people in the right place, but you know, a place that's, that 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 that's inspires productivity and creativity and and, and uh, a willingness to well. Yeah, it, it's. But to get um, better in the, yeah. in the interest 
fitting better, you know, so, yeah. Well, okay. well now, now you're talking about cultural yeah. issues. So yeah. you have an entire culture in survival, an entire culture in desire, mm. an entire culture in obligation. Now you're talking about culture change because one individual in that can, you, it, it is, a, it, it's very challenging. Mm. But I, there are individuals who get out of the box and lead their cultures out of the yeah. box. That is possible. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. It needs a cultural intervention. I mean, you can look at society right now and just where people wear it, there's a culture of mask wearers who are in obligation and doing their duty and following the rules. And then there's the culture of mask wearers in desire who are protesting and um, rebelling and refusing to wear their masks. And neither is very effective, actually. And no one's choosing no one's making a powerful creative choice in that situation, whatever you think is right or wrong. Yeah. So now we're talking about cultural interventions. Yeah. And again, I've worked with cultures to shift their entire cultures yeah. into, a state, in, into a culture of creativity. But you need to know how and you need tools and you need some people within the culture who are willing to be brave, be unpopular, take risks, call people out, um, and um, stand in the midst of the despair without mm -hmm. colluding in it or getting sucked into it, which yeah. Yeah. Th that's self-mastery. Okay. Well, hopefully uh, I can encourage and entice you back. Maybe we should have a chat about doing something like that, because I think uh, uh, a discussion about how you because you know I know about group dynamics and being able to you know a group of 30 can be influenced by three people or it just takes a handful of people to to get it into their head without being revolutionaries but they can there are still steps that can be taken to to break out of that that that, that sort of uh yeah uh, when you're in that box, yeah. when you're out of the box you become inspiring yeah and you take people with you and you stop judging people if you're judging people you're still in the box to be clear Sure and certain, for sure. But when you're out, you become for them. You see their potential. You start to take them with you. And you become an inspirational role model. And people go, how are you doing that? How are you being like that? Tell me how. Yeah. OK, right. Like well, that. thank you. So that's definitely um, a, a future session, I think. So yeah. uh, I, we shall now have to move on. I've got an eye on the clock. We've got a few minutes to, to go. Paul, Mr. Walter, did you want to say something? Well, not only tell you turning your video off. Um, oh, uh, sorry. I know oh, you can. Hi, hi, hi. By all means, hello. by all means. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Well, my, my apologies. I have some pretty rubbish internet. I did think that was very helpful, and it, it made me think of there's a Steve Martin film where he's he's he, he he's 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 a he's the father of an enormous family in LA somewhere, and his his wife says to him, Steve, do, you know, do, do you have to do that? And his his answer is, my whole life is have to. Um, and I think that um, a lot of us that work in these professions, and particularly finance yeah. professions, a lot of it is about creating, creating a have to for people and creating a have to for yourself. Um, yeah. It doesn't. It? It's, it's, it's about controls and ensuring people do stuff. So, so, so I did. So really, it was just to say thank you because I, I, I do think there's ways of thinking about which box you're in are actually quite helpful. Mm. Thank you. I think I would like to just distinguish. Um, it's the have tos that kill the creativity. Mm. It's not the procedures or the regulations it's our attitude towards them yeah. that kill the creativity that's a really yeah. important distinction to make yeah. that we tell we say you've got to do this and you've got to do that and that's how it's communicated follow these rules follow these regulations um but it's not they're not the things that put us yeah. in the box we put ourselves in the box always by what we think and that's the great news about this, because because we put ourselves in the box, we can get ourselves out mm. really in response to very dire situations sometimes. OK, thanks, Sophie. Right. Yeah. Let's let's call our poet in residence to. <laughs> Wonder what's going to happen now. <laughs> to declaim. Uh, Paul. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. I can see you, yeah. Yay, superb, superb. Um, thanks, Sophie, that was brilliant. Um, I was actually ahead of you because we um, we went to Devon last week uh, to some spa hotels, a um, couple of different ones um, each day. And the one thing that I noticed about the spa hotel 
experience is that each lobby you walk into has a, a big photograph of a pebble. Uh, so I tried to balance the karma of these places by um, every beach that we went to. I took a, a, a big framed photograph of a spa hotel and put it on the pebbly beach. Okay, <laughs> here's a poem um, about I'm ready. Kirsten Ray's. Um, it's called Difficult Patient. <laughs> if you Google the word, the word motivation, you are lacking any fixed or movable posts to your goal. After all, the desire to create is the deepest yearning of the human soul. Are you ready for this? Pucker up for a creative kiss. Intensity has become the new normal. Yes, we are survivors, but there's more to being immortal. Crisis is the birthplace of creativity, but it shouldn't be a constant going into infinity. Obladi, oblada, obligation. Life goes on. Even in the last chance salon, you can stay desire, but burnout is part of every fire. Being who we are instead of who we are not is always the best offer in society's shop. As we crisis into another self worth, into another self worth proven reaction, probably just like Mick Jagger, you won't get no satisfaction. Each one of us is a chance for you to rethink your devices. Creativity is a world of possibility. Embrace it, expand your soul's elasticity. Wow, you wrote that while all this was going on. That's amazing. I, I did, without a cup of tea or anything. That's yeah, amazing. you should have been listening, Paul. I don't know how you do that, but you must be out of the box. I'm sure of that. <laughs> Thank you. We shall publish that um, um, overnight, hopefully. And uh, so you better read that out to your colleagues. And with any luck, we'll have a, uh, a video of it as well to, to put up over the weekend. We shall see. So... I sure. So thanks again, Sophie. Thank you very much. Thank you for having Another me. Another magnificent piece of work. Um, so I've just briefly closed the meeting by, well, thanking both Sophie and Paul. And uh, looking ahead to next week, the 15th, I believe we have Mr. Alastair Forbes, who is from Network Rail and uh, currently on the call, um, listening in uh, to come and talk to us about uh, controls uh, and their use within within Network Rail. So I shall look forward to that. I hope that you will all be able to join me again. Uh, as I said, I hope you got the video of last week from Stephen Carver. We will be looking to circulate that, that again uh, with Sophie's uh, video, probably Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. Um, and I will also circulate the link that Sophie provided there separately so that you can you. have a go at the framework yourself and also keep tabs on Sophie. So there'll be some links to connect with her in her day-to-day -day stuff. Um, just a reminder from last week, Carol, you, Carol Still, uh, asked for some volunteers to work on a focus group to do with employability skills. If you haven't yet responded, um, please do, because I think that date is rushing up upon us. I'm not sure how you got, uh, got on with uh, the gathering together of your groups, Carol, if you're there. Um, but uh, let this serve as a, a reminder. Are you there, Carol? I am. I am here. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. And yes, please. Uh, still okay. in need of people. That's good stuff. Thank yeah. you very much. OK, Thank well, um, I shall draw this week's conclusions to a close. Uh, uh, wish you a very bright and sunny week ahead. Look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Um, goodbye. Thank you, Steve. Bye bye. Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Sophie. You're welcome. Bye bye.